Thank you very much for that very um, humbling kind of introduction. And of course, uh, throughout the entire day, uh, we've had a very interesting uh, series of uh, conversations. And of course, uh, in this uh, studio, I'm joined by Rohit. Thank you very much for uh, accompanying me uh, in this rather cold studio. Uh, and around the world, we've, uh, we do have a very illustrious panel. David Freed, Wu Ming Tu, uh, Rob Galbraith, and of course, none other than the ever-famous Dr. Rosvinder Singh. Let's start with uh, Rohit. Uh, we want to ask uh, the whole pertinent question of whether or not COVID-19 uh, has a profound effect on public health insurance and the future. Uh, but more importantly, we have to also understand uh, the quick interpretation of what it means uh, when COVID-19 hits a particular country, hits a particular economic, uh, socioeconomic growth area, uh, and we want to try to see how we can pair this with the kind of lessons that we've learned throughout the entire day. Um, so Rohit, how has COVID uh, changed your life? Uh, do you think uh, this is something that is going to be permanent, or do you feel that this is just a touch and go, there's going to be more of COVID-19 situations that's going to impact us uh, in the years to come? Uh, I think, Ibrahim, thanks. First of all, thanks to all the panelists. Uh, it's great to have you all. I, I think three and three parts to this. The first one, I think, is COVID's changed my life personally, for sure. Um, I have kids. I have, I have monkeys in the background all the time. Um, so there are some interesting stories, I'm sure, like most of us have. I have two little boys at home. Um, and, and the line somewhere between professional and personal life has completely merged. There's no end time to a day. But that's a conversation around mental health I'm sure at some point we will have. The second part, I think more professionally, while in the interim it did possess a lot of challenges for us to run our business, I think more longer term it's actually going to be a big fillip for insurance industry. Because what we have seen traditionally is whenever there's been a catastrophe, insurance has been one of the first industries that has bounced back because awareness level increases. You look at travel, uh, our business in, in Middle East, thanks to Orient Team, went up four times in the first quarter this year. Why did it go? When 100 people traveled earlier, about eight or nine bought travel insurance. Today, when about 23 people are traveling at the same, all 23 are buying travel insurance because either the government makes it compulsory or you are not traveling without a travel insurance. The third part of this conversation is, I think we, can, we all need to come to this conclusion that we can't live against COVID, we just gotta live with COVID. And the question is, how do we live? Just, just in this studio, you might be thinking, Ibrahim and I'm sitting very close by. You can see we get cut off because he's actually sitting very far away from me. So that's the new world we live in because Ibrahim and I had to do a, you know, a test before we entered the studio. Uh, so the world has changed quite a lot. Yeah, of course. And um, I have to admit, uh, I'm still suffering from the poking up my nose just now. Um, Dr. Rosvinda, living with COVID, um, people keep on saying this, but, but what do we do? What, what, what does it mean when people uh, have to live with COVID? And how does COVID change our life um, moving forward uh, from this? Okay, uh, so on, on a personal note, I think uh, first, thank you uh, for the Tune Protect team having me here on the panel today. Uh, it's a thrilling experience to share this stage with uh, so many uh, wonderful uh, people from different backgrounds. Uh, on a personal note, I would say that how COVID has changed my life, just, just like, like Rohit mentioned just now. Uh, so there are, there are pros and cons. There are positive impacts and there are negative impacts. And I think on the professional front uh, and, and also on the development of my career as a public health, specialists, uh, dealing with some, dealing with this pandemic of, of this magnitude, it has certainly changed a lot of, of uh, perspectives on, on how, uh, how the fight with this unseen enemy can actually be, right? And when I look around, I see a very, uh, uh, a steep general awareness, a rise in general awareness of health, especially when we see, you know, people improving their, their cough and sneeze etiquettes generally. Yeah, we see I, I, at my practice, we are also seeing more and more people coming forward to actually get their, their yearly tests done, their yearly checks done, uh, because they want to know if they do have any underlying comorbidities or not, all right? And, and I think generally, uh, like Rohit pointed out just now, uh, we have to learn how to live with this pandemic, right? And 
well, the way forward definitely is you know to, to deal with something of this magnitude has to be vaccination and you know uh, taking care of the the SOPs. While these things are very dynamic, it will keep changing from time to time. Uh, but I believe that's the only way that we can you know we can move forward with this. Uh, let's let's uh, now move around the panel. Uh, maybe Rob, uh, you can share with us some of the expectations that you think uh, has been set by the populace, uh, and of course, what would be some of the ideas corresponding to these kind of expectations that uh, insurance companies can deliver these kind of solutions that the market wants now. Yeah, I think it uh, COVID obviously has has changed life for everyone. One of the things that I think was really remarkable, uh, particularly at the, the outset, as I reached out to uh, friends and contacts all over the world was actually how similar um, our experiences were. You know, everyone was kind of going through lockdowns in the uh, very early days. And now we're seeing a little bit more uneven, right? Uh, different hotspots, different vaccination rates throughout the world. Um, each country's response is a little bit different, but I, I just thought it was really striking, um, particularly at the outset, um, what a shared experience that we were actually all going through globally. And I, I think that leads into um, what we're seeing in the insurance marketplace today. Uh, I always tell audiences that uh, you know insurance has been around, of course, for centuries. Uh, and so well before our digital age, yet it's actually the perfect digital product in my view. It doesn't require uh, long global supply chains, which has certainly been impacted uh, from COVID. It doesn't require a lot of physical uh, infrastructure such as large manufacturing plants and the like. And so, uh, and the other thing too, is I would say that uh, insurance uh, leaves a lot of protection gaps, uh, both in terms of you know, life, non-life health. and. Uh, those have probably never been more evident than during this time. So what I'm seeing, and some of the uh, earlier panels have touched on this, is really just a, a rethinking of insurance from the ground up. I think the pandemic has actually accelerated a lot of trends that were already occurring in terms of you know, distribution. Um, a lot of things that people used to do in person um, now you know, we're forced to do remote, such as uh, claims adjustment processes in many cases. And so I think it's really put a premium on human interactions. You know, it takes a lot, it's a high bar to kind of um, you know, require a face-to-face -face transactions now. Um, but I think that's actually not a bad thing. There's a lot of humans that have in the past kind of been you know, taking information from screen one behind the scenes and typing it into screen two. And you kind of realized, right, well, are humans really necessary in this process? So I think what insurance companies are, are really doing is number one, innovating. They're coming up with um, new products, new services that are truly customer centric rather than in the past, uh, very much kind of you know, product centric on the shelf as customers came in and needs were assessed. It's, uh, well, let me give you a little bit of you know, products one, two, and five that are on the shelf and that may or may not leave you with some gaps. And I think they're truly being um, you know, uh, tailored now yeah. uh, to the individual needs of, of customers. And I think uh, companies are just, you know, again, rethinking um, all aspects of uh, their business processes as well. And really deciding in, in the parlance I use is, you know, where do we put the humans and where do we put the machines? Let's have uh, computers do what they're good at, um, but you still need humans along the way. Empathy is such a large part of the insurance industry. Yeah, let's talk about this, right? Uh, because um, I see uh, both David and uh, Wee Meng Tu was uh, nodding uh, along the way. Uh, do you agree uh, with what Rob was mentioning? Uh, Wee Meng Tu, maybe? Yeah, absolutely. Maybe I'll just take the floor first. Yeah. So, yes, indeed, uh, big time. I think we are in the new world, and uh, this is still going to uh, have uh, a changing effect. And uh, from an insurance point of view, in my opinion, this is a rebirth of insurance industry. Uh, why is that so? I think we are now living with risk uh, and uh, not just uh, basically a nice things to have for insurance, but really it's a must have. And uh, COVID has taught us that there's so much effect that pandemic can bring such a disruption, such a stress, and such a suffering uh, to all of us, whether you're rich or not, it doesn't matter. 
So I think uh, this is a, uh, a case where we need to really think back and um, insurance industry will definitely play a, large, uh, a larger role, a very important role to shape how the society and the economy. And uh, in my opinion, uh, this is going to be a huge change where everybody just needs to look at what insurance is about for their life. David, um, of course, people are more aware of their health needs now more than ever. Um, this is something quite interesting that we've seen. Uh, a lot more people are very interested to get healthier. Uh, a lot of uh, people are trying to not get sick. Uh, and this is seen around the globe. Uh, do you feel that because of this, the surge of people wanting for better protection services, better protection products, uh, is going to be something that uh, all insurance companies can't miss? Uh, this very strange window of opportunity. It's a, it's a disaster for the globe, but actually at the same time, it's actually an opportunity for everyone to get better protected. Well, I, I, I truly do believe that um, COVID has really opened up the eyes of the consumer um, to understand really uh, what, what their worries are for health and for protection and how they can keep their family moving should there be a death in the family. And it's really, it's, it's in the seat of the insurance companies to be able to respond to that. And my own view is I don't look at this as a rebirth. I see this as a catapult to things that have been talked about within the insurance industry for a number of years. The insurance companies have been talking about automation. They've been talking about tailoring of products. They've been talking about providing suitable and flexible benefits. And they've been talking about underwriting um, uh, technology and uh, data and analytics. And my own view is that the insurance companies that can pull this together right now and provide these solutions in an easy um, to obtain manner um, will be will be the winners out of um, out of the post COVID world, whatever that world is going to be. Yep, uh, Rohit, I see you um, uh, agreeing to that kind of question. You want to take that up as well? So I'll give you a very interesting example. So David obviously leads a very interesting company called uh, Preferred Global Health. Uh, we started working with them and we've just launched a critical illness product in Thailand, which is a fully modular critical illness product. So not the typical traditional critical illness where I sell you 50 critical illness, 70 critical illness, 100 critical illness. And you know, I go to Google and I search 90 of those critical illness I've never heard in my life. Uh -huh. It was pushed on me because when the premium is higher, I can hide a lot of my distributor margin and many other things that I can do. That was how the traditional world worked. Here we are saying you buy one, two, three, four, five, it's up to you. And more importantly, through David's organization, we are providing second medical opinion and concierge services to our health customers. Now, why am I saying that's special? It's not the service that's special. It's the fact that David's organization and our organization executed this in a COVID world without even physically meeting each other. The typical traditional insurance world was, you come and meet us, let's have a brainstorming, then the governance guys are going to ring this till death to say what will not work. Nobody's ever talking about what will work. Yeah. That was how insurance worked. And here we are saying, Let's go live. So we went live in Thailand. We're going live in Malaysia later this year and Vietnam shortly. So the new world tells you that things can happen. And as insurers, we've realized that there is this opportunity. I, I, my, my wife had a friend who recently wanted health insurance. And that friend called me and said, explain a lot of things. And after about 20 minutes, I gave them the name of a particular company and said, you should go and buy this company. And my wife listened to the conversation and said, you never mentioned Tune Protect and you guys sell health. I said, but here is a high net worth individual and Tune Protect is not for high net worth individuals. We are focusing on millennials and that's why our products are cheap, our products are easy to buy and less complex. So to your question, I think what this situation has brought about is historically insurers always focused on affluent people. 
but there is a market which is under penetrated and suddenly the awareness level has gone through the roof. If you went and told a millennial earlier, buy a health policy, a 25 year old tells you, oh me, I won't get cancer, don't worry. But now if you tell them you can't travel without a health policy, you know what? Travel, mobile phone and health are three things that matter the most to a millennial. They are traveling. Trust me, if the government's allowed now, they are all traveling. Just today we saw Lankawi uh, hotels are already overbooked. Yeah. So I think that's what this whole pandemic is showing us, is this awareness can spurn an opportunity. But if we try to sell the same, you know, old cookie in the old jar, it's not going to sell. We got to sell it cookie by cookie. If you sell a jar, nobody's buying it. Let's talk about this. Because um, maybe Dr. Ruswinder can, can pick this up. There's a lot of uh, government uh, involvement in terms of regulation, uh, anywhere from compliancy to trying to make sure that people are safe in general, uh, and to varying degrees. In Malaysia, we have that amount of degree. In Singapore, um, Western countries, there's a lot of uh, different variations, but government intervention is also important to be discussed. Do you feel, Dr. Ruswinder, do you feel that... Um, uh, this is uh, a price that we have to pay, uh, that uh, in, a, in the sense that government will have to regulate a lot more and we have to be a little bit more compliant at the risk of penalties and some punitive measures. What, what do you make of this? Well, I think uh, these punitive measures were initially introduced because, uh, you know, we were unable to measure the, the uh, compliance of, of our people whether how compliant can people be to these uh, regulations and these SOPs and these uh, mandates that are being carried, are, are being, you know, uh, put out for the population. So uh, way forward, I think we need to, you know, we, like we said just now, we need to live with this uh, pandemic. We need to live with the virus. So way forward to this will definitely be, you know, easing these uh, regulations uh, step by step. I think, I think we have all heard and how the uh, new... Uh, you know, the uh, FASA Pemulihan Negara yeah. that's been introduced and, and how uh, Klang Valley has been moved to uh, phase two at this point of time. So I think a lot of these uh, uh, decisions are made, uh, keeping in mind that it is finally the time where the population itself needs to be responsible for their health. Yeah. It no longer has to be the regulations or, or uh, you know, these... Uh, Rob, um, I see you're, you're trying to uh, add on to this. Yeah, no, I, I think this is exactly the struggle that, uh, you know, we've had. We've treated, I think, COVID in many cases uh, like a temporary phenomenon, almost like we were uh, waiting for that bridge to, uh, to get the vaccine. And I actually find it, you know, quite miraculous that uh, vaccines were developed so quickly that are so effectively. Um, obviously, you know, we're having uh, challenges getting them out to, to all parts of the world um, and getting people, you know, they, they talk about shots in arms, right? You know, getting the take up rate among the population. But I also think that we're kind of moving into this next phase where um, you know, we've realized that's, that's actually not sufficient. Uh, and it is this kind of next phase of, of really managing risk, right? The virus is, is changing, it's mutating. We keep hearing about you know, different variants around the world. Uh, we know that not everyone is either, uh, either able or willing to, to get the vaccine for many different reasons. And so COVID is gonna be part of our life for the foreseeable future. And um, I think uh, just, you know, like Dr. Singh was mentioning that uh, it, it's, we're seeing resistance in some cases to, government uh, uh, measures. And I, I think there's a little bit of a, a you know, a, a push and pull. We're still trying to find that that balance. I think in the early days, right, um, it was fairly clear there was this you know, clear and present threat. And now uh, we are kind of going into this um, managing the risk uh, 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 segment that, you know, we're really struggling with as a society. But I also agree with Dr. Singh that ultimately um, allowing people to gauge um, within you know parameters reasonableness, but um, you know how they uh, which activities they choose, whether they choose to travel or not, how they choose to protect their health, et cetera. We're, we're going to have to just give people information, give people options, um, and uh, allow individuals to have a little bit more 
um, I guess, ownership yeah. uh, in terms of, you know, really uh, living with the risk of COVID for the foreseeable future. We've got some questions lined up quite nicely. Um, let's start with this. Uh, the medical second opinion services are not a new concept for the insurance industry. Um, uh, with COVID, however, uh, what recent trends around the globe or specifically in the Asia-Pacific region are driving more focus on this important service uh, to meet the need of the customer and increase the engagement? Um, perhaps uh, Meng Tu can pick this up. I think David is... David. David. All right, go ahead, David. Okay, thank, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, as you say, medical second opinion is not something that is new to the insurance industry, not new to the medical world. But um, I mean, historically, medical sec second opinion has been all about one doctor reviewing another doctor's um, work and giving an opinion. Yeah. And it stopped at that. And um, individuals were really not aware if that opinion was any better than the first opinion that they reached. What I do see in where medical uh, second opinion has begun to go is more towards what I call diagnostic verification and treatment plans. And what I mean by that is rather than one doctor looking at another doctor's piece of work, it's about a team of doctors breaking down a diagnosis and looking at that from radiology, pathology, oncology or cardiology, whatever it is, and coming back with a, an opinion. And that is either a re-diagnosis or an affirmation of diagnosis. But what I'm also seeing is that where it has to go further, and that is actually giving the patient um, and their family a treatment plan. What are your options? What can you do? Um, to actually get um, the best outcome for yourself. So therefore they can make informed decisions. So it's not just one anonymous doctor making an opinion, but it's giving all of the information to the, um, to the patient. On top of that, what we are seeing as far as trends is as we talk about um, coming through COVID, wherever we may be in that whole, um, uh, in, in the whole COVID pandemic, what we are seeing is that um, there is more and more um, uh, calls for health awareness, more um, calls for diabetes management. We're finding that um, the second opinion world, not just advancing in its own right, but it's also look, it has to look more at chronic illnesses as opposed to just critical illnesses. And it can't just be a one-time affair. It's not necessarily here is our opinion, here's or even here's our treatment plan, but have an ongoing dialogue with the patient. So if you put this team of specialists together who have actually looked at the patient, given a treatment plan, there should be check-ins in the future. And that's gonna be required when it comes to chronic illnesses. And how do you actually um, manage your diabetes on a day-to-day? -day? Do you have the right technology? And um, are you able to manage um, your dietary needs or dementia? Um, it's not necessarily a question of, um, has the person been diagnosed, but what are the best treatments? What is the way the individual can have the most meaningful life going forward? So I see a lot of advancements that are taking place, a lot of move into mental health, a lot of move into cr uh, chronic illnesses and diabetes. And I believe that the, uh, what has historically been the medical second opinion companies have to actually advance in order to meet these needs. And this is where we're, as Rohit said earlier, yeah. we're very pleased to be able to offer these type of services now to the masses in conjunction with to protect, not just the high net worth individuals. Okay, so so we're, this is a very important point because diagnostic is, of course, the big deal right now. Um, maybe the next question, we can jump into it uh, because um, we all know insurance is 
I wouldn't call it a laggard when it comes to disruption in a long time. Insurance is a very safe industry, uh, yeah. so to speak. Um, and however, in the last few years, uh, many newer players have had a great deal of disruption, uh, which has uh, in turn resulted a lot more funds flowing into this industry. Um, it's also important for us to look at uh, the renewed interest among PEs and VCs. One interesting item that I want to mention is um, Theranos. Uh, uh, Elizabeth Holmes uh, is in uh, court right now, um, this week. Uh, all eyes are on Theranos. They were on to something. They were on to something. In fact, uh, so much so that uh, three big uh, startups, one of them, of course, is being led by Alphabet, have drawn in 200 million US dollars into the same idea what Theranos was about to go to, which is a few drops of blood. You can have a full list of... Uh, um, um, uh, uh, results, I don't know what to call it, uh, blood type results, instead of, you know, taking, uh, uh, you know, uh, two pints of blood from me every, you know, uh, every so often. Do you feel that, that the insurance industry has the opportunity right now to work with these kind of not true and tested uh, sectors yet, but this is the opportunity to do so right now? Um, yeah. So I, I don't know, I'll kick in and Beaming, you can jump in because obviously the interest from VCs and PEs obviously is your yeah, exactly. <laughs> area. Yeah. yeah, I'll just kick in on the first yeah. part, right? Uh, I don't want to speak about Terranos in particular because I've seen some of the videos. I don't, I don't know two sides of the story, yeah. but it's, it's also an ethics point there that yeah. they de-inflated some of their results and stuff. Yeah. So let's not go to that. But I think what we do is Weeming's, one of Weeming's companies which he invested in in my past life, we tested DNA. Can we use DNA for insurance? We mean, I am sure you remember that. That was some time back. Can we use DNA mm -hmm. results to price a product? But we didn't reach a certain level of maturity at that time. We dropped it. Now we are working on health tech, where we are using your your walking data, uh, you know, your mental health data, and we are testing something on how we can, you know, help the customer. We've recently done another innovation in Thailand, which is very interesting, is normally travel um, products are travel products. But in today's world, when in a COVID world, when you travel into a country, you're stressed and you can't meet a doctor. So we're actually giving teleconsulting along with your travel insurance. So it's making what service we give relevant to your customer rather than giving something which is not re relevant. If I had sold... Uh, teleconsulting to a travel customer during normal times, they would have never bought it because why do they need it? But now they are interested in it because when they go into a country, they are sneezing, they don't know. They go online, they can speak to someone. It's different. And we have worked, we have worked with Europe Assistance on that. So we're working with people to drive this. On the health tech side, we work with Naluri. We provide mental health support to our online health products. So what do they do? You can go into the app, it's digitally administered. Yeah. The same way we're doing with David. The traditional way of feet on street model works with a certain customer group. If we have to take it to the masses, we have to reduce the cost per policy or the cost per customer. So if I did it in the traditional way, then I can't afford the customer. So that's why I'm providing digital health therapeutics. I'm providing teleconsulting. I'm providing digital second opinion. And that's how we're changing the game because the per cost changes. But we need like-minded partners. If David had said, I'm going to stick to my traditional cost, his cost of a traditional policy would be higher than my premium. So I can't afford it. But he's been kind enough to work on a pricing which is specific to this audience. So that's how I think there's a lot of space for partnership. There is going to be failures. I have seen a lot of failures as well. Uh, for all the success that's written about, there's probably a list of yeah, projects of that never saw the light of the day. So, yeah. Sorry, uh, Vimi. You want to add on? Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, you know, Rohit has been exemplary case because uh, he's been leading a lot of innovation projects, which I think uh, this is, uh, in my opinion, uh, it has to be the frontier because it's all about innovation. And there's so many technologies today that we are looking at. And uh, uh, Ibrahim, thanks to the case, we are also one of the investor. Um, oh. Oh. Uh, and uh, we pretty much learned our lesson. 
Um, but wow. uh, there's still a lot of uh, advanced technology and science that we are uncovering. And I think at the end of the day, it's all about relevancy. All right, you don't put a technology into a product. You put a technology into a solution. Yeah. And this is where it has to make a difference by bringing the insurance company and tech startup company. And of course, the investor needs to also be educated in this field. It's not about putting the deploying the capital. It's about bringing people together, bring a vision that we want to realize it, creating a synergistic uh, uh, model and scale up so that we can create this whole benefit in a mass, uh, critical mass uh, uh, market. So uh, there's a lot of technology today, I must say that, you know, is ready. At the end of the day, it's all about the mindset, whether the insurance company will want to adopt them and create this into a real services, right? And uh, again, I've seen how Tune Protect organize themselves, how this whole digitization is providing the access of services, but also at the back end, when they're doing the product development, and this is where Rohit leads the team in terms of where the market demand, where's the relevancy of uh, the consumer and the businesses, and where is the relevant technology that is going to be applied so that, you know, it will bring the entire uh, exponential impact to everybody. It's and uh, the short answer is we were definitely going to invest more than before into this space. Yeah, that's like I was about to ask you that because I'll open this question to the floor because it seems like there is this um, uh, in, insatiable want to get the solution up and running. Everybody wants this um, from the market, from uh, the government, uh, from healthcare providers, from insurance companies, and of course, PEs and VCs. However, not many people are fully well-versed in this space, let alone you know, health and all that, but of course, tech, um, and of course, pricing, how do you price these kind of items? Um, do you feel that the, the, the urgency, the sense of urgency is now just so palpable that you need to come up with a solution fast. Uh, the pandemic's not going anywhere, at least not for us in this part of the world. Uh, do you feel that the solution has to be arriving like yesterday? What do you, what do you think of this? I, I'm sure Rob will have a lot of perspective because uh, he's written an exciting book, right? End of Insurance as we see it. Uh, I, I first read only the three first words and I thought I need to look for a new career. <laughs> then I read, read the second part and of course I, I, I follow him a lot so I know. Uh, and I completely agree with what he says. But anyway, coming back, I think, Ibrahim, there are three parts to this again. The first part is we all need to understand that we can't solve all the problems. The, the traditional way, and, and David is, he's, he's been the CEO of Asia of two of the largest insurers and, and banks, right? Historically, all of us focused on affluent and mass affluent customers. Yeah. Why did we focus? In Asia, in the last 20 years, we had double-digit growth in every country. They were underpenetrated. So why did we have to go anywhere else? The margins were fantastic. The new business margin of some of the life companies are 50, 60, 70 percent. So why do I want to look at anything else? So I'm okay to have bank staff sitting in branches, you know, all of that model. Now let's come to today's world. How many of us actually go to a branch? I haven't gone to my bank in the last three, four years. I have never stepped in. So the traditional model is changing. And that is why we need new models to speak to them. Everybody cannot speak in a certain way. You look at Singapore Life's positioning. Singapore Life is essentially a high net worth insurer, but digitally administered. You look at Oscar Health. Health, digital. You look at Root or Sunday in Thailand, AI ML based motor insurance. You look at Lemonade, renters insurance, and they're using data to sell now life protection and pet. And their best part is the percentage of customer who bought product one, who bought product two. So you're seeing different models emerge. And that is why for us, we've positioned it very clearly. We'll only focus on three lines of business, health, 
lifestyle along those three things that I mentioned before, mobile phone, travel, and health, and SMEs. And bite size, anything comprehensive, we are not the person to work with. We will get our tech so good that it's going to be seamless to work with us. The second thing on the tech side, you uh, this is going to be a controversial statement, but I am, I've started saying this a lot more. At the core, every insurer in 10 years from now will be a technology player, full stop. We will be a specialist technology I don't, I don't player. That is uh, controversial. I think because I think a lot. I, I know the it's traditional. Like a duh. I know, yeah. But the traditional insurance folks will tell you, oh, insurance is very technical. You know, uh, those people cannot come and disrupt us and all. And that's why you see some insurers have come up with this concept of, I will disrupt from within, and they set up a company within. Yeah. But what happened was that failed miserably. Yeah. Why? Because at the end of the day, it's the same traditional company. You put you even if you it's put a company within, yeah. it's not. It's like I give you the most fancy app with the best technology yeah. in the world. If you don't know what to do with the data, if you don't know what to do with disruption, it's never going to work. The third one is, I think we all need to accept that it took, and this is where it gets tough, and this is where people like Vimin come in. And that's a conversation we also have. Our strategic investor, AirAsia, obviously understands this. Uh, you know, it took traditional lines of business like agency and banking, agency more so, 13 to 15 years to break even in a life company. Mm. Okay? But today, we expect immediate results. Mm. Hey, you launched this digital product. Have you broken even? Why was there 13 years and 15 years for those channels? But for digital channels, you are asking results in six months and 12 months. Yeah. We have to go to the Chinese way of managing things. In China, what do they ask? How many customers do you have? How long have they stayed with you? How much activity are they having? And how satisfied are we? That's the Amazon way, how they develop the business. That's where insurance needs to go. And that's when real disruption will happen. Um, any of the panelists want to uh, pick this up? Okay, we now have to move on to the final takeaways from the panelists. We are running out of time. Uh, maybe David, you can start uh, with uh, some of the key takeaways on what we should watch out uh, in this space. No, thank you. Um, I mean, I, I think that as we've come through COVID, it, it is bringing about a reinvention of um, the insurance industry. It is catapulting it further into a lot of the areas that had been talked about as Rohit was just mentioning and as um, Wee Meng was just mentioning. It is about really going to be the merging of technology and insurance to provide solutions and a lot of that technology is out there today. I mean, I mentioned chronic and critical illnesses earlier, something like um, diabetes. There have been continuous glucose monitors. There have been um, insulin pumps that have been on the market for years. They're now becoming more and more readily available in Asia. These are things that the insurance, and these are also automated where an individual with their phone can get their um, glucose uh, reading and things of that nature. These are the things that the, should I say, the forward thinking insurer will actually be able to bring to market where you have protection, you have access to the technology. It's actually better for the insurance company's returns. Um, and you're giving the customer the full solution and they know that they're managed. And to be honest, there'll be a better risk. Going back to what Rob was talking about, ultimately it all lines up very, very positively um, for the future. And I think COVID has just allowed people to focus more and to be able to drive this forward for um, quicker. Uh, we may. Yeah, you know, um, Rohit took away my takeaway. Actually, I wanted to say that insurance company will be the company. Yeah, but, because, but uh, before we end this panel, of course, there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of questions from the floor. We'll allow time for that too. Uh, but, but before we jump into the questions from the floor, let's uh, still go around the room. Uh, Rob, maybe? Yeah, actually, uh, I would agree with Wei Wing that uh, I think Rohit really did a great job of summarizing. You know, I, I, you had the question earlier about VCs, and um, I think that Mark Andreessen uh, from Andreessen Horowitz really 
hit the nail on the head. He has this uh, philosophy of software is eating the world, right? And so wherever you can program things, um, they, they will take over. So, you know, autos, for instance, are, are really um, computers on wheels these days. Like we know that there's uh, just a lot of uh, software that's in a vehicle. So um, you also have this merging of the online and offline world from the past. A lot of things were, you know, very exciting on the you know, the internet, mobile computing, et cetera, but yet other aspects of our lives, including insurance, felt like they hadn't changed in you know, 30 or 50 years. And, and so that's changing. And then you also have accelerating costs. So, you know, things like uh, the provision of, of health services, um, costs continue to escalate. And so lots of uh, smart people around the globe are really looking at applying technology, applying new business models, and really trying to bring down both the cost of providing uh, services such as insurance solutions, as well as bringing the losses down themselves. And so, um, you know, I, I think there's just ripe with opportunity. Insurance is a $5 trillion global industry. But as Rohit indicated, you know, you're really tra trading speed um, of, of, of return, right, and ROI for scale. So if you can be patient and, and have patient investors in capital, um, it's just going to take longer than other industries to disrupt, but I think that you're going to be more than paid back in terms of um, what you're able to accomplish if you uh, stay the course. Thank you, Dr. Rosvinda, before we start uh, taking questions from the floor. Okay, I think I'll just uh, conclude based on my healthcare provider perspective. So uh, the impact of the pandemic on globalization has been uh, massive. I mean, we all agree with that. Uh, in my opinion, insurance companies should, shouldn't be working as a template. They should not be a template. They should actually provide a buffet uh, to their customers, you know, where they can pick and choose what they really want. Yeah. And uh, I think a take-home message from the pandemic, you know, on how we are managing things here should be to improve the public-private partnership. That is essential. We need to digitalize healthcare and also automation of services should be a priority. I mean, this, this is definitely things that we should look uh, on for the future. Okay, that's, uh, let's start with the questions. With younger people owning lesser cars and homes, uh, what do you see as the future of insurance since motor in most markets is more than 50% of the sales? Rob, maybe? Rob wants to take it? Or? Rob, yeah, Rob, go ahead, Rob. You want to... Yeah, I think this is a terrific question. And actually, it's something I've been talking to a lot of organizations about. Um, you know, I have a, my oldest is a 20 year old uh, daughter, and she has no interest in driving. So um, she hasn't even gone to, to driving school, much less, you know, been added to our insurance policy. So that's premium that they're missing out on. And with the advent of, of ride sharing, right, um, she actually lives in a world now where you know, even outside of a, a major a metro area, you know, she's able to to get around without uh, having her driver's license. Um, yet, I see so many insurance companies kind of reinvesting in lines of business that drive the most revenue. So, if you know, motor insurance is sixty percent of your business, uh, they get you know sixty percent of the dollars kind of reinvested. So, you see all these investments in you know things like telematics and the like um, in a business that really has stagnant growth, right? Kind of one to 2% a year. And there's a lot of kind of um, driving customer acquisition costs ever higher because you're really trying to you know, steal customers, right? From other competitors in a, a very hard fought battle um, just because there isn't that organic growth. Mm -hmm. So I think it really is important to um, uh, widen your aperture and to look at um, underserved populations or where people are looking for solutions that products don't exist. I know there's companies out there that are uh, ensuring your Amazon package or other packages right from being stolen from your, your, your porch and things like that. We've seen explosion in travel insurance, pet insurance, mobile phone insurance and the like. And I think these are just the, the tip of the iceberg. So um, I think it's imperative that companies look beyond kind of those traditional lines. And this is Perhaps back to what I mentioned too about insurance traditionally being a product centric approach. Um, you design your contract, you file it with the uh, relevant authorities and regulators, right? And that's a, a laborious, time consuming process in many jurisdictions. Um, and, you know, then you kind of have this, I guess, barrier to entry. And so you don't really modify it very 
much and you don't quite frankly listen to your customers very much in particular when there's maybe an agent or broker that's sitting uh, between you as the carrier and, and insurers and so i see um, you know, smart companies are really seeing areas of opportunity, finding ways to overcome some of the obstacles and being much more uh, nimble and creative in terms of um, merging both uh, products and services to be a, a full solution uh, for customers. We've got a few more questions, actually. Let's uh, pull up the next one. What will become of traditional insurance products and traditional distribution channels in the era of new normal and digitization? Can I take that? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Dead. I don't They're think dead. I don't think they are dead. <laughs> um, I genuinely don't think. I, I run an advisory channel too, and I believe advisory channel will be as relevant as they were before. Now, some of you might say, hey, this guy is just contradicting. No. You look at historically what was an, I, I call it almost agency 2.0. That's, that's how I've been calling it. I've written a blog on this as well. Why do I say that, right? Agency typically, what, was, what were they doing? Four appointments in a day because they have to drive their car in KL traffic, Bangkok traffic, Jakarta traffic, you may never get there. That's a different point. But you have to drive in those traffic. You have four meetings in a day. Um, you sell, you come back, finding a parking lot. Today, they're sitting at home, selling through Zoom, you know, and they're probably doing 10, 12 meetings. You look at many of the mature markets, it's not that advisors have fallen off, especially in advice-based products. Actually, their productivity has gone through the roof. Mm. And a lot of the not so good advisors have gone. That's where you had mis-selling and all that in the past, right? All of them are going away because the regulator is tightening up the rules. The insurers are tightening up the rules. So they're becoming more digital. They use our tools. They're becoming more productive. But they are selling more higher value products. If you want to insure your, your building or a ship or um, a, 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 you want to buy a complex legacy product, you need someone to advise you. Most people do. Okay? However, if you want to buy motor, home, travel, pet, why do I need a, an advisor? Because motor is the most commoditized product in most markets. Mm. Travel is the most commoditized. I can tell you, we insurers love creating products. Mm. But, and, and David's run many companies. He'll tell you, one of our struggles with marketing teams are, why do you have 14 motor products? Mm. All products are the same. It's just that every year you have to make one differentiation to create more noise. But, but that comes down to the product management team, That's KPI. You have to come distribution, up product yeah. management, all that. Yeah. So for me, these products will get automated. And these products will be gone off traditional channels, in my view, except for maybe a little bit of relationship sale here and there. So I do believe these traditional channels will remain relevant, uh, but in a new form. All right, let's, uh, let's do another speed round thing. Uh, another question, please. Th there's a lot of concerns on the underserved and underinsured communities. Any thoughts from the panelists on how technology and insurance companies uh, or insurance can play their part? Viming, do you want to chip in? Sure. I think, uh, you know, technology itself today is getting more simplified uh, with our mobile app. And uh, you see, all these underinsured communities or underserved communities uh, were all lacking of in knowledge. And I think uh, if the content can be built from a simplified point of view to those community, there's no reason why technology is not able to reach out to them, okay? Because we are all talking about if, what's, if Facebook can allow you to sell and buy, right? Why aren't, uh, you know, basically in technology uh, in this sense will not be able to allow communities to further understand what insurance can serve their needs? Dr. Roswin, I want to pull you in here because uh, peripheral uh, communities, um, their only contact point in terms of getting health, not just service, but of course advisory, is down to their community doctors. Um, in Malaysia, the setup is Clinic Desa, Clinic Kesihatan. Do you feel that there is this strange um, relationship where the doctor is out there trying to 
provide the best healthcare service to the patients. But at the same time, um, trying to get the patients uh, to be better served in terms of getting better protected, uh, get the best insurance policy out there. How do you think uh, the future of community medicine is going to push forward in terms of trying to get the underserved and underinsured communities better protected? Okay, so uh, Ibrahim, in my, in my point of view, um, for every type of healthcare service that is being uh, put out there, there are, always, uh, uh, there are always four pillars to this uh, healthcare service, maybe mental health or uh, the NCD, CDC health, whatever. You know, the first should be awareness, right? The public or the people out there, whichever population that we are catering to, they should be aware of uh, what are their needs when it comes to health. The second thing it is availability, right? Whether are these services available to them? And then we talk about accessibility. And finally, we talk about affordability. So I think the affordability bit is where the, the insurance companies or, or maybe the, the national uh, you know, healthcare financing program uh, plays a big role in that. So uh, these, are, these are aspects that if, if you're talking about the marginalized populations out there that, that, need, uh, you know, that, that need access to these healthcare services, then definitely we need to look into uh, whether uh, can they be covered by either various other methods of, of healthcare financing in the country. So I think these, these talks are also in the line where, you know, the improvement of uh, uh, financial access as well as financial uh, healthcare uh, are being in the talks right now. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's to answer your question. I just wanted to add, right? So, in fact, uh, David can chip in as well on... on one of the ways we are using technology to increase accessibility, for example, as I said, for critical illness, second opinion. Yeah. Because when you are a mass customer, as we call it, person who cannot afford international health care, you probably go to one doctor. I'm not saying the doctor is wrong. I'm just saying. But what David's team provides is an access to a panel, as he mentioned, to give you a second opinion on how else can you treat this now, for me, I think pulling back on this question, there is a need, Dr. Rosslyn is absolutely right in saying there's a need for the industry to work together. Today, insurers do not come very high on trust across the world. It's a reality. It's, you know, insurance, healthcare, pharmaceutical, unfortunately, all supposed to be very noble professions, have some of the least trust ratios in trust service. The reason is COVID came. What did we say? We cover, we don't cover, we will cover. You know, there was a discussion. Yeah. What, and, and there is a lack of trust because I'll tell you why. There are, four, there are four people involved in this process. The first is the customer. The sec, and, and that went back to the personal discipline that Dr. Oswinder was talking about. The second is the distributor. The third is the hospital where the person goes for a treatment. The fourth is the insurer. What is happening is the same case in a private hospital, 29 year old healthy person goes in for emergency appendicitis operation on a Friday, his bill comes 30,000. Another 33 year old absolutely healthy person goes into the hospital on a Friday emergency appendicitis, his bill is 19,000. One is a keyhole surgery, other is an open surgery. Mm. We ask the question, why is there a difference in the bill? Hospitals are not gonna answer us that question. Now, and that is where if we can tokenize health services, the cost will come down, which means insurers can also help control our costs. And because employees do not have any skin in the game, unlike US, we don't have a defined contribution method. Mm. We have a defined benefit method mm. in Asia, mostly. I know Singapore has now started with compulsory deductible, mm. but we don't have that yet in most parts of Asia. So when you don't have that, what happens is employee has no skin in the game. Employee in Asia, in many countries, hate to say this, but we still have um, medical leave tourism, which is go and lie down in a hospital if you have a shoulder pain or a back pain, just get admitted because you get a couple of days away from work okay. and it's covered. I'll give you an example. In my past company, we, start, we noticed a particular trend in a particular year, I'm not giving you too much details, we saw that 13% of our claims came from shoulder injuries. Mm. 
Okay. We put a control that if, if there is no procedure involved, it's no more cashless, it's, it's file and pay. The 13% became less than 5% in no time. Okay. Now, we could control this cost, which is going to help the customer back. Yeah. So what I'm trying to say is there's a need, as Dr. Rosminder rightly said, for the industry to come together. There's been one discussion, I don't know how far Singapore has gone on it, maybe Weeming knows better, is about blockchaining this whole thing. If you put the hospital, the TPA, the doctor, and the insurer into a blockchain, um, and the, this thing, the money will transfer seamlessly. So health hospitals get the money on time, so they're not complaining insurers owe them money. Insurers don't have a problem because it's tokenized, so all hospitals can only bill me so much. It's a real customer receiving it. So you have less fraud, less leakage, et cetera. So that's one thing that some people are testing. For me, maybe that's the future. Will Tune Protect test it? Watch the space is all I can say at this point in time. So I, I don't know, David, if you want to add something, because you've been in the space for a long time. No, Rohit, I think, I think you hit it. Um, you hit the nail on the head. I think that um, it is about how how do you invent an industry to be able to provide service, provide solution, not actually be saying no? Because I mean, insurance has been way too rules based for a long time. And having spent so much of my career there, that's what gave me the attraction of going into healthcare services. It was, a, and what we say as our team, it's how can we say yes? How can we actually do what our partners and what our customer and what our customers and patients require versus come up with a rule of how it doesn't happen? And again, the more we can make this seamless, as you were explaining, whether it's blockchain or whatever it may be, um, I think that is where the future is taking us. My final question um, to the panelists and perhaps even to you, Rohit, because uh, I think uh, this question perhaps uh, relate to you the most. Um, is that uh, government as a stakeholder, um, a regulator for that matter, uh, do you feel that uh, they really need to uh, get up to speed with the things that you guys are doing? Uh, because otherwise, it's all for mood. Absolutely. But I'm not saying this because I actually have somebody from Bank Nigara today in the conference. I'm genuinely saying this. I do believe that Bank Nigara is doing a lot in Malaysia, and I'm genuinely uh, saying this. Yeah. With the sandbox when that- When you point out the <laughs> Bank Nagara as an audience, of course, that would be the- <laughs> No, but on a serious note. Yeah, yeah. Uh, with the sandbox <laughs> approach that they have now, there is definitely an approach and acceptance across regulators, because you're seeing digital bank, digital insurance. You're seeing these licenses in Hong Kong, in Malaysia, in Th Singapore. You're seeing an acceptance from the regulator. Having said that, just like how as companies, we need to go through our own change management journey, they are also going through a massive change management journey. Because on one side, their biggest job is preservation and prevention, consumer protection. That's yeah. the most important. So in the garb of innovation, because you've seen some of the recent news in some of the countries in China, et cetera, you obviously need to find that balance between governance and innovation. Have we got it right? Of course, we have a long way to go. Can we get better? For sure. For me, I would say there are probably two asks. One is I think boards and regulators need to be more forgiving on mistakes. Um, because on one side, you talk about agile. But on the other side, you don't want us to make mistakes. Yeah. We will make mistakes. Yeah. When we are going on digital, you know the world we live in. You know the cybersecurity and the ransomware the world we live in. Now, I can invest on APT, IPS, things that yeah. the technology guy earlier spoke about, many things I don't understand, but I can invest on the best of technology. Yeah. But hey, you know what? There are people out there who are smarter than us. It's a reality of life. The second thing that I think where we need to work together is, I think more and more countries are now starting to look at proportional regulation. You may be too big to fail, but can you, be, can you be small enough to disrupt and fail? And that's where sandboxes help, because then even if I fail, the impact on the economy is not much. When you're too big to fail, obviously there are larger socioeconomic questions that come into play. And that's where somebody like us, we can happily be a guinea pig to 
you know, regulators within the region, you know, to say, we, we launched, as I said, in, in Thailand, a modular CI product. So obviously we had to work with the regulator there to launch it. So that's where I think there is more work for us as an industry to evolve. But I'll leave you with one comment. Vini Chua, who was there earlier today, she once told me something very interesting. And I told my team, uh, not at this company, one of my previous companies, saying, guys, we should all dig uh, a hole and put our head in it. She said she sometimes finds the legal and compliance folks in insurers more complex than the regulator. You know why that is? Because these governance folks are stressed a lot. Because on one side, the regulator is asking. Yeah, yeah. On one side, the boards are asking. On the other side, the management is asking, yeah. saying, I cannot fail. Ensure we are correct. So what happens? They become more traditional than traditional. And of course. The, the, the power of self-regulation is just uh, enormous. Anyway, um, that is uh, uh, one way to end uh, a forum. I just want to add one comment. Yeah, go I ahead. I want to thank, uh, I, of course, thank all the panelists. But I think uh, there's obviously I want to thank specifically Dr. Roswinder because unlike a lot of us who were sitting in our house, I've seen videos and photos of him in PPEs all day, uh, handling human life, but also unfortunately people who passed away yeah. because his team helped in cremating them as well. So I think hats off, uh, Dr. Ross, you do something which I think many of us cannot. So yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Right. Not Thanks. Just yes, we all in this together. And of course, to your team and the larger health community I'm talking about. And of course, yeah. That's it. That's all that we have uh, for you uh, for today. Um, I'd like to thank David, Weeming, Rob, again, Dr. Rosvinda, and of course, Rohit, for um, this very enlightening conversation. I will give back the floor to the Master of Ceremonies. Thank you so much. Thank you.